in the universe, meaning matter in stars, the shining matter in stars, and this includes black holes, which we can trace to a large extent due to shining accretion disk around them. And this is also including other objects, heavy objects, which we can trace uh, due to, for example, lensing of light. So if there was only this visible matter in heavy objects like stars, planet, the galaxies would not form. So there is not enough visible matter to make this galaxy clustered. So there are filaments of something which are called, which is called dark matter in between galaxies and which we can also see by many methods. One of them is lensing the visible light from, from other galaxies, which is filling the universe. So if you make a cake plot of the universe, the small piece of cake is actually around 4% of the whole cake is matter as we know it today. So matter made of proton, neutrons, electrons. Then uh, around 20% of matter energy content of universe is so-called dark matter. Why we call it dark? I mean, it's not really dark, it's just transparent, and we call it dark because it does not have this property, nice property that protons, neutrons have to cluster in stars and start nuclear re reaction. So it doesn't cluster, doesn't make stars, doesn't shine, that's why we call it dark. And then, there is even more, around 75% of a substance which is not matter, which is energy, and we call it dark energy. So, to, all, all together with Higgs, uh, we still know only 4% of the universe. There is more puzzles there. People you know, like to unify things. So like we have uh, several senses, uh, sight, uh, hearing, touch. Actually, all these senses, they transmit signals to the brain via electromagnetic interaction. So there is some unification there. Particles have their own other senses. that They feel these forces that I spoke about. They feel strong force they feel electromagnetic force, they feel weak force. And at our energy scales, these forces have very different strength, right? So, for example, weak force, if you were not going to school, you didn't hear about it, but electromagnetic force, right? Each time you try to remove a woolen pullover, you see these flying sparks, so you would know it. The strong force actually is very strong, even th that you don't see it, because it can keep protons repelling each other inside the nuclear. So why all these strong forces and with dif why all these forces with different strength? Apparently it happens that if you measure charges of the force which cause the force as a function of energy and you go into higher and higher energies, you notice, and the part of this curve which is done here is due to measurement, you notice that this strength coming closer and closer together, but not quite. If you would assume that the only particles which exist to affect these charges are standard mother particle, which I talk about, they would come close, but not quite. But on the other hand, if you assume that this division between bosons and fermions, as I said before, is artificial and then exists another symmetry linking bosons and fermions and adding a little bit, adding new particles, this is important for us, and you predict how these charges would behave in, with energy at quite high energies, all the interactions will have the same strength. So they will become 
one, so we would have much less things to study, you know, if we existed there, just one interaction, and this is clearly good. So the conclusion is there must be something beyond the standard model, even with the Higgs particle. And there were many people trying to figure out what, uh, what is there beyond. And supersymmetry is one of the ideas. Other ideas are extra dimensions, so that space except of three dimensions have, that we observe in everyday life have some other dimensions to which we cannot penetrate so easy, much smaller, but maybe gravity can and it flows away there and that's why it's so much weaker than other forces. You don't think of gravity as being weak when you try to jump up, but if you notice, that is because the whole Earth is pulling you down, but if you try to think that with just small magnets you can peak pick up paper creep, you see that gravity is much weaker than, than other forces. So these extra dimensions could, could explain why the gravity is so much weaker. But there are also other ideas that, for example, there is another layer of substructure. We've, we observe now, these days, that quarks are the, an electron muon are the most elementary particles and point-like, but maybe if we increase energies we can look inside them and we will see another layer of substructures that happened before. So these are ideas beyond technicolor. But what's important is that all these ideas, whatever they are beyond the standard model, they lead to existence of new particles of masses of around tera electron of volts compared to one giga electron of volt for our unit for a proton mass. So masses of thousands of mass of protons. And this is what we want to study except of Higgs boson and the LHC. So this is a kind of idea of supersymmetry that each particle has a boson has a shadow fermion particle. If the supersymmetry was uh, exact, they would have the same mass, but if it's not exact, actually we know already it's not, this particle could be heavier, so like left and right symmetry, right is maybe exact on the surface, but not exact if you look inside of human body, you find the heart on the left hand side, liver on the other side. So some symmetries, even if they are not exact, can be interesting, and one of them is supersymmetry, Technicolor would uh, imply <coughs> substructure inside quarks and electron, and then there could be some hidden extra dimensions like on this picture nearby. So, uh, so here we have a machine to study all this, and this is Large Hadron Collider. Hadron is a fancy name for protons, neutrons, and other similar particles. So we actually accelerate protons and collide protons in 27 kilometer ring, 100 meters underground. And we have built uh, four detectors to, to study what's happening. Uh, and out of these two detectors, ATLAS and CMS, and uh, ATLAS is pictured there, uh, CMS is pictured here, are general purpose detectors which, uh, for example, look for Higgs and supersymmetry. There are two more specialized detectors, ALICE, which is looking at collisions of heavy ions and for example, looking at the very interesting state of matter called quad-gluon plasma, and LHCP, which specifically looks at the class of particle containing big quark. This is second to heaviest quark, which lives quite long, and you can study, you can distinguish particles containing it from other things to it, and this detector is specialized in that and bringing lots of interesting information. But I'm going to talk more about ATLAS and CMS now. So if you went uh, for a ride in the tunnel, this is what it would look like. And the most important element of the Large Hadron Collider are magnets. So to push energy 
to such to what we are using now is between 3.5 and 4 tela volts per beam of protons. To keep protons with such a big energy inside a 27 kilometers ring, you have to force them to stay there. And the thing which forces to stay them are magnets. And these are, these are the major costs. This is superconducting uh, 8.7 Tesla technology. So you have a big ring essentially filled with this uh, big superconducting magnet, which needs to have a very strong field to keep this proton inside. And this is because you cannot make the tunnel larger. So uh, in this uh, in this tunnel or around this tunnel, 100 meters underground, uh, there are there are this general purpose detector, and this is a cross section of Atlas. This is cross section of CMS. So uh, CMS means uh, compact muon solenoid, uh, and um, Atlas means a toroidal detector for LHC, a, a toroidal LHC apparatus. Uh, so, and you see that Atlas is a little bit bigger. Of course, I'm happier because I'm Atlas member that Atlas is a little bit bigger, but uh, CMS is actually heavier. And what determines the size of detector is, in this case, magnet and technology. It's chosen for magnetic field. And again, magnetic field is very important here because this is magnetic field which allows us to bend tracks of charged particles produced in collisions and measure their momenta. So CMS has chosen solenoidal magnetic field, field going along the beam axis, so beam is coming in the center perpendicular to this plane, whereas ATLAS has both technologies, has solenoidal field in the middle, and this big thing are magnets to produce toroidal thing, field going around like that, to detect particles which manage to go out, and these are mostly new ones, the ones which we can detect, in the air core magnet technology. So this uh, determines the size of ATLAS. So ATLAS is placed in a biggest man-made man-made cavern and you can see this cavern in 2003 where it was still empty and the person here doing measurements and then the cavern started to be filled and you can see this on this uh, short animation building detector in the cavern, so for example putting these uh, elements inside is more or less like building a ship in a bottle. It's the same but on much larger scale complexity and difficulty. So actually this, uh, all these big elements were lowered down via shaft in, in, and there was even not a place in the cavern on the straight line to put them, so they needed to be tilted while lower down, and all of them, each of them weighs around 80 ton. So this is one of the most famous Atlas pictures where all the, solid, where all the toroidal uh, coils are placed in, and the thing which is coming in now is a calorimeter. Calorimeter is detector which uh, has a role of stopping particles which can be stopped and measuring their energy by stopping them. CMS had another difficulty. CMS is compact but heavy and was constructed very much on the outside of the cavern and then it had to be lowered in nearly one piece down and this is an extremely heavy thing and a special crane need to be constructed to actually lower it down in one piece into its position in cavern. Alright, so these detectors are there, 
to collect data from collisions. And you can think of each of these detectors as around uh, 100 megapixels camera, because this is how many electronic channels they have to collect data. But what are these data? So the design collision rate is 40 million of collisions per second. At the moment we are working with just 20 million of collisions per second. So it's, you know, it's a piece of cake for 20 million of collisions per second. Out of these 20 million of collisions per second, we cannot store all this information. So our detector is actually like a big computer it has to select 50 interesting collisions per second for further storage. So this is done by the so-called trigger system, both on hardware at the detector level and the software level, big computer farm connected to each of the detectors. And then, once we collect this, this data, packed it somewhere, we need to from these signals in the detector, which are just hits in, you know, pixels in uh, this 100 megapixels camera, we need to reconstruct particles and see what are these particles, measure their energy, measure their momentum, measure their charges. So if you look at the delta volume, you collect uh, per event around two megabytes, then you reconstruct it, you end up with one megabyte. What you want to store is around 0.1 megabyte per collision event. But then per year, this makes petabyte of data or big petabytes. And if you would like to store them, these petabytes in D, uh, DVDs, the stack of the DVDs would grow uh, to the farthest balloon in around one year. So uh, I'm not sure if you would get construction permit for such a big tower. So this is not the best way to do this. So what we do this, we distribute this data for all over the world and analyze them all over the world in the grid connected computer centers. So this grid technology, uh, Norway actually had a big role in developing one grid flavor, but essentially this shows some snapshot of a grid traffic at some moment of time of one of the three grid flavors, so it's a bit, a bit biased thing, but essentially all this computer center get data distributed and they store it, they process it and when I, simple physicists, want to look for this and this event number taken this and this time at uh, being of this and this interest, I have to fetch it from somewhere in the world, but actually what I do, I just write a little instruction on my machine and this my machine finds this place in the world where this data is and does something with them and brings me the results. So this is the, the grid technology in practice, the very distributed computing. So this is just a few slides to tell you how super performance of LHC was, which allowed us to find Higgs and uh, but what I'm going to tell you, uh, show, is something which represents the amount of data which we take. And this is called integrated luminosity. Luminosity is a measure of intensity of the beams. If you multiply luminosity in these units via interaction cross-section, so something which tells you about probability of interaction giving certain result, probability of proton-proton interaction giving certain result, then you get a number of events that you expect to collect and look at and analyze. So just to tell you that we've been, the Higgs discovery is due to the 
analysis of data taken in 2011, and this is around five inverted femtoborn, and part of the data taken up to July 2012, Higgs' discovery itself was announced on the 4th of July, so in some sense we were analyzing this data nearly up to the last minute, but uh, as you can read in a nice article wrote, in, written in Bergenstein and Dev by Bjarnes Tugu and Trigweb Wannes, and which appeared yesterday, it, this data plus this data corresponds to one million of billions of events which had to be analyzed. Is it right, Bjarne? Yeah. <laughs> That's what I read. So, so actually, you know, this data plus this data is one million of billion events which had to be analyzed to fish out quite a small sample of events of interest uh, to us. There is another difficulty in this, uh, in this game is that the way beams collide is that you have one beam packet, I cannot really show you because I have to keep this microphone, you know, in my... So you have a, the LHC beam is made in packets, both beams, so this is one beam, this is another beam, they go against each other, and in this packet, in each of these packets is around 10 to the 11 protons. And then it's the packets which collide, and then of course what we would like ideally is, uh, okay, we need as many collisions as we can get to fish out rare processes, but then what happens is that in the packet collision there is also many protons which collide at the same time. So, and this makes it difficult for us. So for example, you see here, what was reconstructed in the detector are tracks of these particles and during the one beam crossing there is many many collisions reconstructed and only one of these collisions in this case is uh, interesting and in these collisions we observed uh, one of the heavy particles the boson of weak interaction decaying to two muons Right, so uh, to analyze this data we have to do lots of computing and what you can see here is the number of jobs, analysis jobs and jobs also producing simulated data, Monte Carlo running in the whole world while we needed to fish data for Higgs and the line shows 100,000. Except of things that are new, so except of processes which lead to production of Higgs boson, there are also other processes which lead to productions of particles that we already know, that we already observed in other accelerators. So how to fish what's new when there are of lots of old stuff and uh, sometimes not interesting anymore, sometimes still interesting to be produced. So we need to measure first all the processes that we know that already exist and here you can see the process, so for example production of two heavy weak interaction bosons, ZW, production cross-section, which measures the probability of the production versus the amount of data that we needed to measure it with our accelerated produce result. And the Higgs boson would be on the scale around one picoborn, so it's not on the scale yet. Right, but here it comes. And what this event, what this picture shows is uh, Two events, so one in Atlas and in one in CMS detector, which are most probably or very probably due to Higgs boson production, and the one in Atlas here shows uh, 
Higgs boson decaying most probably to two heavy bosons, Z particles, and one of them decaying to two electrons, one of them to two muons. Electrons are marked in green, muons, tracks are marked in red. So we can reconstruct this track, and from their kinematic parameters, we can reconstruct the mass of particles which decayed into these electrons and muons, and from this we can also reconstruct mass of the Higgs boson. Okay, so uh, Higgs discovery was uh, announced on the 4th of July and uh, lots made lots of headlines, so this is very fun when the basic physics discovery actually makes uh, headlines uh, all over the world, also in popular. And that's That's how the Higgs boson looks uh, like uh, to us, <laughs> right? It's a peak on the mass plot on the background. So you reconstruct the mass invariant, so-called invariant mass of two photons, and this invariant mass tells is the mass of particle which decays to two photons. So this is a so-called two-photon channel, and this peak above the background tells you that you've seen something compatible with the Higgs boson. Now, we quantify it in a statistical way, so we... And you can see it on my t-shirt, and I'm the only one in this room who has such a t-shirt. <laughs> so we can quantify it in a statistical way, so we can plot a probability that what we observe is due to background only. So to everything but not Higgs. So uh, the probability that what, and we plot it as a function of hypothesized mass of this Higgs boson. So if we plot this probability, suddenly at the mass of 125 giga electron volts, this probability gets very small, 10 to the minus 9. So the probability that what we observe is a background only is very, very small, 10 to the minus 9. And you can see this uh, on the scale, kind of a large scale, around 125 GB on this plot. So uh, here it is, right? And actually, uh, if, if the Higgs boson is there, but you still try to analyze the data pretending that it's not there and estimate the probability that they are consistent with Higgs boson not being there, that for the Higgs boson you expect this line. So what we observed is quite consistent with what we would expect from the Higgs boson. And how this improbability of the data being explained by background only has grown with time, you can see on this plot. So. Uh, you know, there is this peak going, being deeper and deeper, that this improbability peak drive being deeper and deeper with time. And at the, actually our res latest result, which uh, was published now in uh, <coughs> this uh, journal, says that if this hypothesis has a probability of not being Higgs, of being background only 10 to the minus 9. So very, very improbable. Right, but now what we need to do is actually measure the properties of this particle that we observe. So measure accurately how it decays to various types of known particles, how it decays to photons, to Z bosons, to uh, w bosons uh, and other decay channels and see how this is compatible with the Higgs boson hypothesis. So this is a new plot from uh, CMS which shows the ratio of decay rate of this particle we observe to what is expected for the Higgs boson. So far it's pretty close to one but uh, Actually, I would like it to be a bit, 
away from one for at least some of them because then this Higgs boson, if it's not exactly like the standard model Higgs boson, can be even more interesting. So what are the plans for the future? Uh, we had the, been planning so-called long shutdown to upgrade uh, the machine mostly, but also detectors uh, to some extent in 2013. So now we got, because of Higgs boson discovery, we got some more months uh, of running uh, and then it will be still in 2013, but a little bit later. There will be 18 months shutdown. After that, the machine will give us even more data and, and even more energy. So it will run at uh, higher collisions energies and it will look even more back in time into Big Bang. And then after that, there will be a few more upgrades, mostly to increase the data rate, increase the luminosity which will allow us to look for more rare and rare processes. Okay, so uh, it's clear that I'm not able to speak as fast as uh, Sergio Bertolucci <laughs> think he's able to speak. So will the Higgs boson change our everyday life? And uh, the answer is uh, yes and no, as usual. So what I'm going to show you is applications of CERN research into the areas which are not immediately connected with uh, Higgs boson, right? And you have various types of applications and uh, measured by number of pat papers, patents, uh, applied things. And if you sum this up on the one axis, you see that there is lots of things into medical physics, so into health. So, for example, there is a <clears throat> byproduct at research by so-called CLISTAR collaboration and CMS is a clear PET, is a integrated PET and co computer tomography scanner, which is doing something interesting here, tracing the source inside the dead mouse and you can make such a nice picture of inside of the dead mouse and see the source, electro uh, radioactive source which was implanted there. But also very important is, right, if you apply any radiation to, to living beings, be it a mouse of a or a man or a woman for that matter, um, 